projecting the sausage. Okay. So Do we have, has somebody tried to reach out to Phil and Trisha and Henry? Who I else? just texted Henry. I, I think Henry might have uh, Les Miserables either practice or, or rehearsal or production tonight. I uh, see. But I'm, so, Tom, can I ask you to mute your microphone? I think we're streaming live, so I just want to make sure we're not going to get feedback. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to 10 Acts Ward 3 Candidate Forum. Um, we have five candidates, it looks like, with us tonight. I don't know if we'll be joined by a few more along the way, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Beth Mellon. I've been working with tenants in the district um, for almost two decades. So I'm happy to be here with 10 Act and be able to uh, help moderate this forum. And with me tonight to help is Bill Rice. And so Bill, if you wanna introduce yourself and then we'll get going with um, kind of how this is gonna run. Hi, I just unmuted myself. I'm Bill Rice, as I think all of you know, I've been covering the race on Twitter and uh, have worked at the DC Government Department of Transportation federal government consultant and so forth. And I'm particularly interested in the DC archives. So if anybody, we don't have a specific question about that, but if you wanna volunteer to get on my good side, you will be, uh, you will make a, a good favorable comment about the improvements in the DC archives scheduled to go to UDC. Thank you. So we, are, I wanna just give a quick run of show for our candidates and audience. We are gonna ask each candidate who's here tonight to give an opening statement up to two minutes. We do have a timer box and so you should be able to see the timer. Um, and we ask you to please respect the timer because we have a lot to talk about. We are then gonna um, go into some questions and we're going to, I think for the most part, be asking you to do one minute answers. And again, the timer will be there. Um, I will kindly interrupt you and Bill will kindly interrupt you to try to keep on track. Um, we're so pleased to have um, candidates here tonight to talk about housing issues and perhaps if we have time, a few more issues. So with that, what I'm going to do is start in alphabetical order by last name and then we'll just rotate who goes first. Um, and so that means I'm gonna turn it over to candidate Ben Bergman to go ahead. And if I mispronounce anybody's name, I've met several of you out on the trail, but please correct me. And so I will start with candidate Ben Bergman, please for a two minute opening statement. Great, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Bergman. I am an ANSI commissioner in uh, the Wesley Heights area. I live in the, the towers on Cathedral Avenue and I'm the chair of ANSI 3D. I'm, a, I'm an attorney, a former public school teacher, and a, a dad of two small kids. Um, you know, I, I am running on a, a platform focused on making the city more affordable. I think we have really an existential crisis facing us uh, in the next few years. What kind of city are we going to be after the pandemic? How are we going to deal with the crisis downtown? How are we going to deal with the fact that Despite all of, all, all of the disruptions, the uh, economic disruptions, housing is just, if not more, not, not just, it is much more expensive than it was even two years ago, four years ago. And everyone talks in every election in DC about housing and about affordability. It's a constant. The rhetoric is all there. It's all on point. And there is even broad agreement about some of the solutions that we need to do, but we're still here we're still dealing with the same problem. So what we really need is a, a council that will be vigorous uh, when it comes to oversight, that will be aggressive in pushing forward changes that will move us forward. We can't be content with small uh, bore projects that uh, you know, are impactful in their own way, but don't add up to, uh, to move us forward because we're just basically running in place over and over again. So that means building much more housing, thousands and thousands of more units in Ward 3 and across the district. It means taking uh, seriously the challenge of, of our older buildings in the ward, making sure that they remain part of our affordable housing stock by keeping, uh, by investing in repairs and making sure that we are holding landlords accountable 
for their obligations under the law. The law, in many ways, doesn't need to be changed. It just needs to be enforced. And that's my time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, candidate Deidre Brown, if you will go next. Thank you. You are muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, my name is Deirdre Brown. I'm a Ward 3 resident. I have five children, three grown daughters, and two sons who are still in school. Um, I'm a small business owner here in the Ward. I own a company. I'm a former ANC commissioner. And more importantly to tonight's discussion, I'm a housing advocate. I started this in law school. I went to UDC, David A. Clark School of Law, right here in Ward 3. And during that time, I represented tenants in landlord tenant court, represented tenants in housing condition court, and I worked with one of the administrative hearing judges uh, over in the um, housing, administrative housing, affordable housing um, committee, where we worked with tenants who were trying to form tenant associations and or were uh, suing their landlords for implorable um, housing conditions. I once I started my title company, I continue that work by working with uh, a public policy committee for DCAR on housing issues, lobbying the city council. It is really important to me as a Ward 3 resident and as children who have children that I would like to be able to come back and live here in the ward near me. So one day I'll have grandkids and I'll be able to see them easily, that we have more affordable housing in Ward 3, that we are leading from a position of equity and inclusion. Um, one of the reasons I ran is because what we've been doing in the past and some of the policies we've had in the past have worked for some, but it doesn't work for all. And so it's really important that as we have these conversations, that we're talking from a position of making sure that anyone who wants to live in the ward can afford to do so, including our seniors, our families, and our workforce housing. Thank you. Thank you. And we will go next to Bo Finley, please. Canada Bo Finley. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for hosting tonight. Um, I'm sure some of my fellow candidates will uh, might be tiring of my, my sort of intro stump speech. but uh, <laughs> So I, I believe strongly in the dignity of the person, and that is sort of the impetus for why, am I, why I'm running to, uh, to represent Word 3, and it's sort of the font from which all my policy proposals flow. I believe our government should uh, not just be responsive to our current needs, but also plan for our future needs. Uh, it must provide opportunities for us children and for our grandchildren to thrive. And I think we need to elect leaders with experience, vision, and empathy who will fight for all of us. Uh, we need to elect someone with roots in the district who knows our past and wants to help guide our future. Uh, I was born here and attended school here. Uh, during weekends in college and law school, I work at my dad's shop on Connecticut Avenue. Uh, now my wife and I live in Cleveland Park, where I've lived the past 17 years. Uh, I represent my neighborhood on ANC 3C, where I currently serve as a chair. I've been on the commission for about six years now. Uh, there, I fight for safer streets, you know, protecting our environment and for transparent public prophecy. I believe, uh, you know, we need to elect someone who has analyzed, analyzed budgets and crafted policy. We need someone who has specific proposals to combat the affordable housing crisis and the environmental crisis, the climate crisis. Uh, I spent my entire career in public service. First as a federal auditor, where uh, I worked with an, inspe an inspector general's office, where I led reviews of a $1.8 billion capital program known as Amtrak, then for 14 years as an attorney with the FCC. Uh, at the FCC, I worked on a range of issues, including you know, the scourge of robocalls, uh, expanding access to low-income households for phone and internet service, uh, holding large telecommunications companies accountable when they failed to comply with the FCC's public safety rules. And so, yeah, I think I've got the experience and the... Uh, the policy proposals and chops to be the best council member Ward 3 can offer. Thank you. Thank you. And then candidate Matt Fruman. Thank you very much. And thanks to Tenac for hosting this forum. I'm Matt Fruman. I'm a husband, a father of three DCPS, one of the few lawyers in Washington, DC. Uh, for the last 15 some years, I have uh, been a community activist playing many different roles. I, I too served on an ANC, chaired the ANC for three years. Uh, I, the, I am on the board of Tenleytown Main Street and chaired that board for three years, working to promote and support our local businesses. Uh, I'm at home on Western Avenue, which is a uh, assisted living nursing facility that serves low-income DC seniors. 
uh, I've served on a series of different mayoral and council task forces, chaired some. Uh, I, I am a court appointed lawyer and court appointed mediator. I have broad inside of the DC government. My goal the ward and the city safer, affordable, increasingly great place to raise a family and age in place. And I have done work in each of those areas, working with people to build coalitions, listen, come up with creative solutions and get things. Use the opportunity and questions and answers to talk about those examples of those things. But I feel that I bring to the table experience in the ward, experience in the Wilson building, experience across the city that I can represent Ward 3 effectively on the council and make this the best place it can possibly be. Thank you. And finally, candidate Eric Goulet. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Goulet. I'm a resident of Palisades here. I live here with my two sons, Alec and Chan. And I've been a proud public servant in DC government for the last 19 years. I've served as a DC budget director for four years and then budget director for the council for four years. And we managed a $14 billion budget during that time. And I think that experience is what's led uh, me to want to enter this race, to really return uh, to the council, uh, to serve the residents here in Ward 3. Uh, with really a passion on the issues that are important to the board. Uh, one thing I was really proud of, since this is a forum on housing, when I was budget director, I wrote the law that put 50% of the surpluses that we have into the Housing Production Trust Fund. And I'm really excited about that because that is our key tool here in the city to produce new affordable housing. And, and what we really need to recognize, and I think the basis of this forum should be, is that housing in D.C., is considered a human right. Housing should always be a human right, affordable for everyone, safe for everyone, and have healthy housing without any sorts of you know, issues of mold or uh, decay that could cause health conditions. You know, for me, what I think is important in this is that we look holistically across the city. We look at the housing needs. We look at the housing needs of our renters, and we try to expand home ownership by expanding DC's middle class. You know, right now in our, our city, right, if you have Government workers, you know, earning two incomes, can't even afford a starter home in Ward 7 or 8 anymore. It's, it's out of sight for many of our residents. And I feel like we've really neglected the category of our residents between 60% AMI and 100% AMI. And we're losing our teachers, we're losing our firefighters, we're losing our police officers who can't afford to live here in the city. So I'm excited to talk with everyone tonight and look at a comprehensive approach to housing affordability and making this a livable, exciting city for all to live. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all. Um, and we did for um, candidate Matt Fruman and candidate Eric Goulet, you all did go in and out just a little bit on your audio. So you might just like lean in a little or we'll let you know if it becomes a serious issue, but just wanna let you know. Right. Um, so we're gonna start with a controversy of the moment. I'm gonna take moderator's privilege to introduce this a little bit more fully than um, I might with other questions. So uh, several years ago, the DC Housing Authority made a deliberate choice to pay higher rents on vouchers that allowed tenants to uh, have greater access to Ward 3 and some other neighborhoods in the district that are higher rent areas. And since that time, not just in this race, but for several years now, we've been hearing a lot of controversy around this. And we have heard the debate conducted in a way that I think many tenants with vouchers, many uh, individuals who advocate or work with tenants with vouchers have found to be off-putting, offensive, uh, and frankly, sometimes racist and discriminatory against individuals with disabilities. And so I'd like to just take this head on. We have some policy issues to discuss, but because uh, even today, a lot of folks were talking about the tenor of the debate. I'd actually like to start and give each of you a minute to just comment on uh, the way some policy issues around this choice by the DC Housing Authority and the impact that has happened on Ward 3 with more tenants with vouchers having access to these services, the amenities, the units 
that are available, the neighborhoods in Ward 3 has created some controversy. And so I, I would just like to give each of you a minute to comment first on the tenor of the debate. And I just want to tell you, we want to pull back then and uh, ask about the policy issues that this raises. And as a council member, what would you do on the actual policy issues? Um, so as I said, alphabetical order, we're going to start on this one with Deidre Brown. And if you would like to make a comment, one minute on the timer, please, for these responses, just on the tenor of the debate in this race and generally. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so in general, I think it's really important that we are very careful about how we categorize people based on their source of income. You cannot look at someone based on their skin color and determine what their income is or how they are affording to uh, live in a property. Um, there are plenty of people who are on vouchers or other type of subsidies or assistance in the ward um, who are of a varied background and varied races. I think what's important is that as we look at these, uh, this situation with uh, people that we're putting in the ward, um, that we are helping them, but we're making sure that we're not criminalizing poverty and that we're not linking uh, someone's source of income to crime or uh, domestic violence or, or any other um, behaviors. A lot of these are families, if you look at the statistics, who are here, who are just looking for stable housing for them and their children, and they're not um, a threat to our community. Thank you, and we'll go next to candidate Finley. Thank you. So I, I brought this up at the, uh, the Washington Interface Network forum last week too, uh, but they had a great question asking about the tenor you know, of the discussion. Uh, when we see someone speaking ill of people because they have the misfortune to be you know, impoverished or participating in a subsidy program, I think we owe it to all of us uh, uh, to call it out and say, that's not right. You know, no one wants to live in poverty. Uh, we also you know, owe it to the person speaking ill uh, to show them you know, they can do better and they're there but for the grace of God go I. Uh, I want to thank uh, David Luria, Harry Goral, Amy Schlesheim, Karen Katzen, uh, Andrew Koval, Marlene Berlin, and others uh, who have who've been speaking with great nuance and sensitivity and urgency about the intersection between the Housing Choice Voucher Program and rent stabilized housing. You know, we see the incentive structure for landlords is set up in such a way that uh, they aren't taking care of their existing tenants. And so we need to find the right balance there to figure out what we can do to make sure that all tenants are secure and safe where they live. Thank you, candidate Fruman, if you would like to go next. Sure. So I, I also want to call out the people who Bo just listed who have been working on this issue. And, and I, I actually think the tenor of the debate gets difficult in a lot of because there are issues with this program. The deputy mayor appeared at an ANC3F program a couple of weeks back and acknowledged the issue first, but when, when first it implies something that follows. And we if we aren't providing them with the wraparound services that they need. And we don't do well when people point out by, by char characterizing that have a and we need to take the time at each other. It's not working. If it's that's worth doing. It's a thing that's worth doing right. And we should all be working together to try to get this thing right. Thank you. I, your audio was cutting out. And so I'm just going to suggest you might want to go out of the meeting, come back in, or I'm not going to tell you what to do, but it was. Yeah. It. And I know you want to be heard or if you want to try scooting back, but um, I want to make sure everyone gets heard tonight. So candidate okay. Goulet, you're up next. I definitely would like to speak on the tenor of this conversation. because I'm really disappointed in my fellow candidates uh, today about the way they've acted about this issue. I put comments out there at a chamber meeting that were fact-based, that were solutions oriented to this program. And everybody wrote this letter to send in. And then the things on Twitter that were said about this are truly horrible. And it was inflamed by the letter. The letter led people in a direction to assume bad things. And, and it was really offensive. So you know, what we're really trying to do, and I, and I can take it, I'm not worried about mean comments on Twitter or anything like that. I can take that just fine. We need to be doing right by the people in this program. And residents across the ward have talked to me and said, this program is not serving our residents well. I'm not afraid to speak up on the issue, 
and say we need to reform the program. We need to provide the supports that the residents need in the program. And, and I'm gonna to be tough. I'm gonna to keep working on tough issues as a council member, and I'm not gonna be afraid to, to be criticized for trying to help people. And I'm gonna say that plain up to all of you right now. And finally, candidate Bergman. Uh, thanks for the for the question. I'll just address one thing very quickly. Uh, the question that Eric was just referencing, the answer that he's just referencing, the question was not about vouchers. The question was how to make Ward 3 more diverse and what you were going to do to make that happen. And you brought up vouchers, which wasn't relevant or responsive. Um, but moving on, uh, you know, I think the thing about this whole discussion is there's a lot of conflation of different things. There are various housing assistance programs. There are, there's Section 8, which is income-based. There's rapid housing uh, vouchers for people who have experienced homelessness. There's, there are different, there are a range of programs, right? And so we need to be precise about what we're talking about. And uh, I do agree that we need oversight of these programs. We need oversight of the agencies and also the landlords who will have an obligation to maintain security in their buildings and cannot just put this off on the government. Uh, but I also think we have an obligation to not engage in rhetoric that is false and misleading. When Mary Che went out after a murder and blamed it on voucher holders, when she knew from the police that there were no voucher holders involved, that was despicable. Thank you. Thank you all. So I would like to pull back now and talk for a minute. We'll give you another minute to respond on the policy issues. You all have mentioned some of the issues that have come up, and so I just want to um, go back through some of them. So some residents in Ward 3 have said that they are concerned about public safety and they believe there is a link here. Um, there are voucher holders who have expressed concerns about the treatment they're receiving and their ability to rent in buildings, especially in areas like Ward 3. Um, there are also some, I think, underlying policy issues that uh, with rent stabilized units, for example, that the housing authority is paying high rents and sometimes those are higher than the rent stabilized rent. And so that unit being rented to a voucher holder may mean somebody else doesn't hold that unit and folks have raised concerns about that. Um, some individuals have suggested that perhaps there should be a cap on individuals with vouchers in certain buildings or certain neighborhoods. Um, I have not heard suggestions about that based on other types of income, I will just say, or ways to pay rent. Um, and so I would really like to hear from you all now, if you are elected to the council, you're the representative for this ward, what do you think you can do as a member of the council in terms of legislation? And perhaps if you think it's relevant, what can you do as a leader and a spokesperson for the residents of this ward to address any of these concerns that have been raised. And so we are now gonna start with Bo Finley on this round. Thank you. And one minute again. Thank you. Uh, so, sorry, let me pull, is the timer going? Sorry. It looks like they haven't started it yet. Can we get that? There we go, okay. <laughs> so, you know, as you mentioned, this is a complicated issue. You know, we have landlords, usually in rent stabilized buildings who are, you know, looking to maximize profits. Uh, so they look to the voucher program, which pays substantially more than, than uh, stabilized rent. And we have voucher participants who just want a roof over their head. And they may have family or friends who are staving off homelessness just by staying with a, the tenant who, who's participating in a subsidy program. And, uh, you know, this creates a lot of change and absent the wraparound services that are necessary for those who need it and absent rules to prevent landlords from abusing the system and absent ways to ensure uh, all tenants or uh, all tenant safety is considered, it creates conflict. Now, we can reduce the incentive percentage for landlords. Uh, it's currently 70 to, 80, 70 to 87% above market. And uh, we, could, we could do that. We can, uh, it's a guaranteed safe source of income for landlords, it should be incentive enough. And then, uh, you know, we should require landlords to provide security uh, to keep all of their tenants safe. Thank you. Thank you. And I should have said earlier, I'm going to refer to you all as candidates just because I'm trying to avoid gender labels. So I apologize if that's off-putting, but I don't want to assume how folks want to be addressed. So uh, candidate Fruman, you're up next. So so I've come in and out. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I sound better. Um, part, part of the issue goes to your first question about changing the tenor of the discussion, because we need to be talking about how to make this work so that it can work for everyone and it can help us to address a very, but it isn't working in the way that it should at this point. And the incentive structure for landlords 
can get perverse. And one of the things that you need to do is hold landlords accountable for making sure that their buildings are safe and maintained and are and work for everyone. Uh, another thing that you have to do is you could have a building with 15 residents who have vouchers and they have 15 different service providers and there's no coordination. You need, we need to figure out a way so that we're serving these people efficiently and we know what's going on people. Right now, it's not working that way. The people who are in the buildings who are, trying, who are looking at this and trying to figure out how to make it work are really being constructive. They can get characterized as if they're xenophobic. I don't believe that they are. They want to make them and work with advocates like yourself to figure out how to make it work so it works for everybody. Thank you. And let me just make sure I didn't see the timer this last time. So we can just make sure the timer comes up and we're going to go next to a uh, candidate Goulet for his one minute response. I was just astonished by the last response there to, to talk about, you know, people changing the tenor of the discussion and all of that and not being xenophobic when when all of you just did that to me today. So, I, you know, I just it's really pretty reprehensible, Matt. I, I was really hurt by that, just to be honest. So. Yeah, I'll tell you about this program because the residents in the, in the ward came to talk to me about it and, and they were really scared. They're scared about crime in the buildings, domestic violence, you know, residents who had mental health issues have been preyed upon by people who sold drugs to them and then they bring the drug market back into the building. And, and these aren't issues I'm making up, they're things I've heard over and over again from residents. And we really need to reform this program so it serves the residents in the program. Now, I'm not convinced that residents with behavioral health issues in the program wouldn't be better served in site-based housing where they could get significantly more wraparound services and like a permanent supportive housing environment. And, and I want to work with housing partners and experts on this issue. But again, you know, the cha discuss discussing changing the tenor of this when there was just an attack, you know, on me for statements that I had to put up online because you know, there was such a miscommunication and a mischaracterization by the rest of the people in this field. You know, it, it was really hurtful, it was personally hurtful, and it was really deceptive by all of you. So I'm really disappointed in it, and we should really rise above that in this discussion. So we're, we're at time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and candidate Bergman, you're next. Uh, thanks. So I, I'm just going to focus on, on the question on the policy issues. I mean, I think, uh, Bo touched upon some important issues. So, you know, we, we need to make sure that there are services and that we're following through on those services when we're talking about specifically the, the folks who are, who are on using vouchers because they were recently homeless or, or for whatever reason, not sort of traditional Section 8 voucher holders. Um, we have a commitment there. We have an obligation to do that. I think the other piece of it, though, it, just generally we need to make sure that we're not undermining rent control and that we're strengthening it. I support expanding rent control to include buildings up to 2005. And I think part of that also means that you can't have policy that inadvertently undermines rent control by effectively deregulating units that once a voucher holder leaves could then be rented at much higher rates. So that's an oversight issue. That's, you know, we've talked about this for a long time. Why hasn't the council acted? That's, a, that's the question we should be asking. Why? Thank you. Thank you. And I promise you, we will come back to rent control. Candidate Brown, if you would like to go next. Yes, I just want to say that um, part of the problem here with the conversation that happened the other day is that race was linked to source of income and then linked to crime and domestic violence. Um, that, that's where things went south. But neither here nor there. I would like to say that I just want to be careful about when we're talking about people who are on vouchers. Technically, you shouldn't know who's on a voucher because it's a privacy issue. And so once again, let's just talk in general about people in Ward 3 who may need assistance. I mean, they need assistance with food scarcity, mental health, health care. We should have those programs available to anyone, regardless of their source of income. And we should be providing that to them. When I, as a African-American woman, walk down the street, I do not want to feel that my neighbors are thinking a certain way of me that I'm bringing in domestic violence into their building or being in crime or drug use into their building just because I'm black, right? Because you cannot look at someone and say what their source or income is. So we need to be very careful about how we're categorizing people who are neighbors who are here um, trying to live in a safe environment. 
Thank you all. Um, we are going to switch topics. And one of you mentioned um, the Housing Production Trust Fund. So I'm going to first say, I'm going to stipulate based on the introductory remarks um, that we have an affordable housing crisis in the District of Columbia that continues to deepen and worsen in the pandemic in various ways has accelerated and deepened and worsened that problem. And as I know, all of you know, the Housing Production Trust Fund is a major source of financing for affordable housing at different affordability levels. I think it is also known among these five candidates that the trust fund is supposed to spend at this point half, previously 40% of its funds on units that are deeply affordable, that are affordable to folks um, with incomes at the lowest level which is zero to 30% of area median income. Those are individuals, for example, who might qualify for housing assistance or might qualify for other benefits. And so beyond exercising oversight, which the council does every year, and I think we've seen the results, I would like to hear from each of you other ideas you have for how we can make the Housing Production Trust Fund work for those deeply affordable units so that they are produced and that piece of the puzzle is in place. And we're gonna start with candidate Fruman this time. Thank you. Okay, so I, I need to start by responding to Eric. I'm sorry about that. But uh, Eric, the your views on vouchers actually are not that different from mine. What Ben pointed out at the beginning was that the question was about diversity in the ward and roll the tape show the question, okay? And then right afterwards, because what I said was not every African-American who lives in Ward 3 is on vouchers or it's transitional housing. That's what I said at the time. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe my recollection's wrong. Roll the question, roll the response. Housing Production Trust Fund, all, all I gotta say, cause I'm gonna have limited time here. I chair the board at the Lisner Home. We just landed the first ever housing production trust fund project in Ward 3 to build 93 units of deeply affordable housing. I have found a way to do it. I will find ways to do it in the future. I found a way to do it where we won over all of our neighbors and they supported in support of our, pro they testified in support of our project at the zoning commission. It can be done. It takes working with people to get it done. And that's what I'll do when I'm on. Thank you. Uh, candidate Goulet, your response on that question. Unfortunately, I think I'll need to respond to Matt as well on that. The question that was raised was on how to close, was not inclusiveness, was on how we close the racial wealth disparity gap in, in the ward. And you know, what, what I was suggesting was we needed to also look at residents you know, with vouchers and connect them to job training because unfortunately, given the racially divided nature of the city and our neighborhoods, you know, the statistic that was cited by the chamber was only 4,000 of our residents, you know, in Ward 3 were African American and that poverty tracks with race in the city. So, you know, what I was discussing was the need to tackle poverty. And, you know, and I'm just still, I'm really just horribly offended by, by what you all did. And it really, this just, it, it was too much. But politics aside on this, Housing Production Trust Fund is the most important tool we have in the city. I think we need to focus more on the, the middle range of housing, you know, for housing production, but with the zero to 30% AMI component and making sure we build three bedroom units around our metro stations so that we you know, ensure that families can start to live in the housing we, we, we build. And I think that that's gonna be very important. Thank you, Kennedy Bergman, your response on this. Yeah, so I mean, I think the first thing I will say, I'm gonna slightly disagree with your, I'm gonna fight the, the premise that, that you laid out. I do think oversight has been extremely poor that the council members, you know, learn years after the fact that we're not spending dollars uh, as much as we should be, you know, but they have to wait till an auditor report. It's, the oversight needs to be improved. But I do think, you know, with all bureaucrat bureaucracies, the way to drive them forward is to look at the benchmarks, to look at the measurements that you're, you're using to drive them, to, to meet those goals. And so those are clearly not there. But I think that the broader thing, you know, we need to invest in the, the fund. We need to maybe make that a higher threshold than 50%, but we can't rely on it alone to build affordable housing and to build deeply affordable housing because it's not going to get us there. Just in the same way, you know, a kind of uh, or a smart growth uh, dreamland of deregulation is not going to result 
uh, and, and deeply affordable units being pre, uh, created on scale through the market alone. We have to look through other solutions. That means leveraging public property. That means thinking about social housing. That means all the tools on, uh, on, the, on the table. And we will get to at least a few of those in our future questions. But for now, candidate Brown, your response on the Housing Production Trust Fund, please. Thank you. Yes, I think that it is a great tool. I, I, my own, one of my oldest daughters used it to purchase her first home, and I've had many clients use it to purchase their home, and many of them are um, in that lower income bracket. I think it's important that we have more oversight. What I mean by that is more regular meetings or hearings on how the money's being used, who's being used with, who are the contractors? We have got to hold these contractors accountable to make sure they're putting in that below the 30% AMI. Um, and if they're not, then they can't contract with us anymore. We got to get tougher about this because this is a really good program and it really does help people get in. I agree that this is just one tool in the toolbox. We have other things we could be, we will talk about, I'm sure, tonight, like social housing and community land trusts. But this is a really big chunk. And since we're continuing to increase the amount in this program, we have to make sure that it's working for the people it's supposed to work for. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, candidate Finley on this question. Thank you. Uh, so I, I have the misfortune of going last year after everybody said, you know, little bits of what I what I want to say, which is fine. Uh, so yeah, the Housing Production Trust Fund is an incredibly important tool. Uh, one of the problems we have with it is that we do not have uh, a dedicated funding you know, level. Uh, we, need, we need to make sure that we continue to fund it at an appropriate level uh, because it is such a great tool. Uh, I agree with, with uh, candidate Goulet that uh, you know, we do need to use leverage the trust fund to build, uh, build family size units. You know, and I, I agree with uh, candidates Brown and Bergman that we need to ensure that there's proper oversight. You know, and candidate Bergman stating uh, that we need we need benchmarks. Yeah, we cannot manage what we do not measure, and we absolutely need to make sure that we can measure production of housing in the district through a housing production trust fund. The fact that we underspent, I think, eighty one or eighty two million dollars of the trust fund. I mean, that's that's unbelievable. I mean, that's literally money left on the table that could be used to get people housed who currently are not housed. So we absolutely need more oversight and we absolutely need to leverage this program as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you all. So I am going to give Bill Rice a chance to step in here with a question and then I think he'll throw it back to me for our next question. But Bill, do you wanna jump in with one of your questions? Bill, you are muted. So if you can check. And then I'll say I can throw it to the candidates in case you haven't been keeping oh, okay. up with the rotation. Okay, why don't, uh, let me just give the, a very short introduction to the Wardman, which uh, I think all of you have heard about. It's um, in the context of the mayor, as you've talked about uh, setting a target of some 2000 units of affordable housing in the ward uh, by 2025. Uh, John Falchicchio has said specifically about the Wardman, which uh, was a hotel, the Wardman Park Hotel in uh, Woodley Park, was up for bankruptcy, that uh, the neighbors and advocates wanted the city to buy at bankruptcy, which uh, the city refused, and has now been bought by a private developer who plans to uh, tear down of the existing buildings and build 2,000 uh, uh, units, I'm sorry, 900 units of market rate housing, 72 will be affordable. Uh, in addition to the city refusing to buy it at bankruptcy, uh, the city is now refusing to do something called large track review, which would uh, uh, examine the impacts of the demolition and the building of such a large new housing project in that area. Uh, the question is, what is your position on more affordable housing at the Wardman? Do you think it might be a site for uh, social housing? And uh, if you've already spoken about it, just tell us again what you think should be done with that prime piece of property down there in the southern part of the ward. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, Candidate Goulet, you're up first on this one. Uh, I'm not. I'm not certain we can, you know, go back in time and, and fix what uh, 
happen with the wardman. If we could, you know, I would actually have a different plan for it that's probably different from what other people would suggest, and that's build a school on it. And I really think what we need to really focus on is building more schools in our ward so we can accommodate pre-K, three, and four in all of our elementary school classrooms, and that we can locate the high school uh, on MacArthur Boulevard at a better location and put a pre-K through eight school there. So uh, if there's an opportunity to revisit this, I would definitely look for a school there. I mean, my focus, you know, in terms of building housing uh, in the ward is trying to make sure first and foremost that we allow the opportunity for our teachers, our firefighter EMTs, and our police officers, and many of the other service workers who serve the ward to be able to live here in housing because right now they can't, they can't afford to, and we're losing our teachers at year five because they simply can't afford to live uh, in the ward. And so if we create incentives to do that, that's what I would really like to see. But for the Wardman site, let's go with the school if there's a chance to revisit it. Thank you, Candidate Bergman, you're up next. Yeah, so I'm waiting for the timer, but okay, there, great. Um, so, you know, I think a, a few things. I mean, I, I the large track review process, I think, is something, you know, I have questions about why there's opposition to moving forward on that. It makes sense to me. I think we have to be very um, enterprising when it comes to large these parcels of land. They don't come up, they are not, there are not many of them. And they present a lot of opportunities for schools, as Eric said, for grocery stores, for other amenities, and for, most importantly, building tremendous amounts of housing. You, you, um, you know, misstated at the beginning of your question, Bill, by saying 2000. That would be great. Uh, we need more than that. Um, and so, you know, that we are leaving a lot on the table uh, with the wardman. And I think it, what it speaks to, though, is, you know, there's been so much emphasis, I think correctly, that we have a zoning system that prevents developers from building multifamily housing at scale. And that's true in many of the neighborhoods around where I live where you can't build yeah. apartments. But we can't just rely on that because, as we saw, they won't do it if we uh, if that's all uh, we're doing. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Candidate Brown. I think the Warman Park, I've said this before, is a missed opportunity. Obviously, we had an opportunity to really make this into something great. Um, the I've signed on to the letter that some of the other candidates have signed on to with the War Three Housing Justice for the um, in favor of the. Um, the large track review is probably not going to happen, right? But this is also an example of how inclusionary zoning, we cannot rely on it. They're doing the bare minimum um, there. And this is why we're only going to get 72 units. We need to take the Warman Park, what has happened there, learn from it as a community to make sure it doesn't happen going forward. We have other big projects that may be coming down the pipe and we need to make sure that we do not let this happen to us and our residents again um, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Finley, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, so this, this is very close to me. I live in Cleveland Park. This is just a stone's throw down the road, down the avenue. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely a, a missed opportunity. Uh, you know, when this first came up, uh, my ANC uh, was talking about it and talking about the multiple uses that could be uh, had with the, with the building, the existing building or with a new building. And we hope that, you know, a uh, housing with a school in it and a grocery store, uh, it, you know, some sort of retail as well could be put on that site. I mean, it's a giant site. And uh, when my ANC passed its resolution, we had already done the outreach to the Office of Planning and asked why this wasn't subject to large tract review. And I don't think OP had a, the Office of Planning had a good, good reason. Uh, you know, they did not include the entirety of the property. And, uh, you know, there's no way to really hook a... Um, to force somebody to build more than they want to build. But absolutely, social housing would have been great here. That would have been 600 affordable housing units. And, uh, you know, it's a missed opportunity. And I, I hope we can learn from this and take a more ward or district-wide, uh, you know, view in the future. Thank you. And finally, candidate Fruman on this question. So on the question of large track review, like, obviously, we should have, we should be doing that. We should be using every lever that we have in order to get the most amenities and the most affordable housing on that site. And the fact that we're leaving things on the table is, is outrageous. The bigger picture is the point that people, others have made, that it is a missed opportunity. We should have approached it more aggressively from the beginning. We need to learn that lesson. You could think, wow, it would cost an enormous amount of money to buy that property. But if the city had bought that property and then 
partnered with someone the way that they talk about doing at the Lincoln Theater or at the RFK or Reservation 13, we could have recouped much of that money and gotten to a project that was much, much better for the community. We need to be looking at parcels that come up and purchasing them and then leveraging them to get better projects than a matter of right, minimal inclusionary zoning project that we're getting here. Thank you all for that. Um, so we are going to switch topics again, and then I'm actually going to suggest it's unusual for a debate, but especially because, you know, the temperature has been a little raised tonight that we just take a 60 second. You can turn off your camera, you can chill, and then we'll come right back. But one question before we do that, because we're almost at the halfway mark, um, which is social housing. Several of you all have mentioned that. And I'm looking over at my other screen just because I want to make sure I get these details right. But I think many of you know that um, Council Member Janice Lewis George, joined by a number of other council members, has put a bill before the council with a specific idea about what social housing in the district might look like. But especially for our audience tonight, I just want to make sure we level set on what we're talking about. And so social housing, broadly speaking, um, would be housing that's produced, it's owned by the government, but it has a different model. It is mixed income housing. It is housing where all of the residents would pay um, based on their income level and affordable rent. Um, and the, the specific bill that's been put before the council would have approximately one third of the units going to extremely low income households who are zero to 30, one third of the units going to very low, low income, excuse me, households, that's 30 to 50% of area median income. And then the other third, it could be a mix. And the idea is that this is cost or revenue neutral that the rents paid by folks who can afford to pay more help their neighbors who maybe can pay less. And also that this is a government program, so there's no profit. We just need to pay the bills. We need to maintain the building. Um, and the bill before the council also suggests that there could be some commercial space, but perhaps used for things like a grocery store or a small business or a childcare facility that would be particularly helpful to residents of that building in the ward. So what we would like to ask you all to comment on is do you support this specific proposal and certainly use this as an opportunity to say anything you want to about social housing generally and your support or opposition, but also if you do not support this bill or social housing, please tell us why. And we're gonna start back up at the top on our rotation. So candidate Bergman, you're gonna go first, thank you. Uh, great. So, I mean, I think the bill's exciting. Um, I'll admit I have not read the legislative text yet, so I, you know, I, I can't uh, opine on the on the nitty gritty details. But I think, in broad strokes, we need to be doing bold things, and we need to not be afraid of doing big things. Um, and this is a big thing. It's also not a new thing, right? I think this is like a thing I talked about at the Wind Forum, where we have this provincial uh, attitude in the United States when it comes to policy, where well, we don't do it here, so it's it's somehow very strange and can't be done. We, you see that in healthcare, you see that in education, and it happens all over the place. So we can do this. We can look at models elsewhere, and we can figure out how to implement it here. I think the thing that I would say is that you know uh, I'm skeptical that it could be the only thing we could do because I think that there will be a cost issue initially um, to to getting it off the ground before we get to that point where it's self-sustaining, um, and that is a place where we could talk about leveraging some of our public buildings and high opportunity valuable areas to fund this um, or, or, or other creative solutions. But I think it's a great idea. And it Brown. Um, if Bauer Warning Council, when it comes up for a vote, I most certainly would vote yes, right? Um, this is a great start in trying to make sure that we are meeting those very lofty goals we have for how many units, affordable units we need. Um, social housing also will allow us to have a wide variety of different people in a location where they can work and play where they live. So once again, we'll have the mixed use, maybe I'll have a school, maybe I'll have a library. Uh, her bill also includes lots of environmental-ish um, uh, touch points, especially removing lead paint, which is um, affects many kids who are um, in the city. Um, and also the other part of her plan that I really like is that it would also give uh, control or board control, so something similar to a tenant association to the residents. And so they'll be able to manage uh, where they live and work with the property managers to ensure that their properties are being maintained and that someone there cares about making sure the houses were safe and stable going forward. Thank you. 
Thank you. Candidate Finley, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, so social housing is something that I, I'm glad a lot of fellow candidates, I know guys, I say this every forum, but I'm glad that, uh, you know, that you all have come along to the, the greatness of social housing. Uh, you know, I, I've been saying it since the beginning of the, the campaign that we need to do social housing in DC or at least more of it. So it's not just a foreign concept. It's not just in Vienna, Austria. It's not just in Singapore. It, it happens in Boston. My wife used to live in social housing in Boston. Uh, it, it works in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, it works in the townhomes on Capitol Hill, uh, which were former the, formerly the uh, Ellen Wilson projects. Uh, you know, it, it works here. Uh, we need to move forward with it. We need to make it a, a regular tool in our housing production toolbox. Uh, you know, we need to make sure that when we build, uh, invest in social housing, that we're, you know, including amenities like a playground or a gym or, uh, you know, having a commercial set aside for a smaller locally owned business. And we can use uh, what I've been calling an acquisition fund, thanks to the War 3 Housing Justice folks, uh, to procure property so that we can actually buy property and start this and build a housing portfolio so that we can end up paying for the social housing we're going to create. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Freeman. So I'll join the chorus. I think it's a great idea. As soon as I saw it, that she proposed it, I, I endorsed it. I think the using this model as one of many is very healthy and it can be very successful and we ought to be trying it and we ought to be doing it. It goes to what I was saying before about how you can purchase property and then you can partner to get a project done and get some of that money back. And I think Ben was talking about startup time and uh, the, but we can do this, we can have seed money, we can get it going. And I think it's a really important thing for us to be doing. The environmental components of the bill and the companion bill on, on lead pipes, also super important. The lead pipe bill, um, the jobs that can be created could be, re could be very, very uh, helpful to lift up incomes and get people employed. So I thought when she came out with these two bills together, that it was a really important step forward and I for sure would have been shoulder to shoulder with her. Thank you. And finally on this question, candidate Gooley. Well, thank you, Beth. And I, I may close this out here by going back to some topics that are, are making some of my opponents uncomfortable. With social housing, I, I think it's an interesting concept. I think we need a public hearing on the bill first so we can listen to our residents. But I am concerned about the pass-through mechanism of it going through DC government. I'm not sure that that's the right way to try to manage the program. If it was going through WIN or Pathways to Housing or one of the great nonprofits that manage our housing process, I think that might be a better way to go with it. So I, I wanna hear the hearing, I wanna hear from our residents and then I think the bill needs tweaks and I think we should roll it out slowly on a pilot basis. Because to be honest, like the, the DC government needs to do a better job overseeing what it's doing now and we as council members, frankly, need to be willing to ask tough questions about what we're doing now if it's not working for our residents. And I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to lead for Ward 3. And frankly, I don't, if people want to attack me out of political expedience like we had today, that's fine. Send letters. I'm never going to stop fighting for the residents of this ward on issues that are important. And I'm going to make sure that the council does oversight, even when it's difficult. All right, thank you all. So as I suggested, I really appreciate you all are staying on time. You're dealing with the serious issues. We have more serious issues to come, but I wanna encourage you all and our audience, 60 second break, uh, shake it out, do what you need to do. And then Bill, when we come back, I'm gonna ask Bill Rice if he would like to take a question, but let's take a pause, just a short pause, 60 seconds. I'm gonna turn off my camera. I encourage you all to do the same and we'll be right back.
All right, everyone, as folks are ready, I encourage you to turn your cameras back on, get ready for the second half of our debate. And thank you so much for uh, being willing to take a little break there. And if you see me eating chocolate, that's because that's what I do to keep going. So let's make sure Bill comes back. Bill, are you there? Because I wanted to give you a chance to ask one of your questions. I'll give him a second. If he is not back, I can start with another one. All right, well, let me um, start with something and I think Bill will rejoin us. Um, I think there has been allusion to this in some of the comments you all have made that uh, the Bowser administration has been focused on making sure that uh, individual areas across the district have their fair share of affordable housing units, including Ward 3. Um, and Ward 3 is an area that historically has not had the same number of affordable housing units. Um, and so in December, um, the Rock Creek West roadmap was released and that calls for developing somewhere between 1,800 and 2,400 affordable housing units um, and multiple tools are mentioned in that roadmap. So I'd like to give you all an opportunity to talk about the idea of a fair share of affordable units in Ward 3. How can we get there? And as a council member, if you are elected, what would you do to support those goals? And Bill, I apologize. I took privilege of we're going to do this question <laughs> okay. and we'll come back to you. No problem. Um, no problem. And so, and you can include, do you support the mayor's plan? Do you think that number is too high, too low, just right? Um, and then anything else that you would do to uh, support that goal or related goals. And we will start here with candidate Brown. Um, I do support the number. Um, there is some talk that that number may actually be too low, but we have to first hit that number before we can talk about increasing it. And the ways I would look to do that is to, um, continue to look at locations in the ward where we can do mixed um, use, for example, the Cherry Chase uh, Library or the Wamata bus uh, station or the Lord and Taylor site, where we can have uh, commercial at the bottom and at the top, of course, have housing for our residents. This would include senior housing, housing um, for workforce um, uh, housing, as well as it's really important we have three plus units for our families. If we're able to do that along our, our major corridors in particular, increase our density around the metro stations, I think this is one way we can start to really try and hit that 2000 number. Um, that number won't happen by itself. So we also need to look at things like community land trusts, um, tax incentives, and anything else we can do to incentivize developers to put in affordable housing within War Three. Thank you. Thank you, Candidate Finley. Great. So, uh, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of my work on ANC is getting the future land use map amended in uh, in Cleveland Park. We in Cleveland Park downtown, we have one to two story commercial zoning or mixed use zoning, and we can't build housing on top of it. I drafted an amendment to the comprehensive plan that was adopted by council to change that to uh, medium density residential, which allows for first floor retail. Uh, that means we can get more housing in Cleveland Park, which is you know right on top of a metro station, on top of six bus or five bus lines. You know, it's a great place to build affordable housing. Uh, but, you know, to build more housing in Rock Creek West, you know, that Ward 3, basically, you know, we need to we need to provide incentives to reduce barriers. Uh, we need to fully fund the Housing Production Trust Fund, which I already mentioned. Uh, I'd amend our inclusionary zoning rules to include further density bonuses. I'd uh, create local tax incentives. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, how the HANTA uh, tax abatement process works. I think it will do a great job in incentivizing developers to building more housing in Ward 3. And then we need to look at acquiring properties and taking the rate of return from that and using it to buy or build affordable housing. Thank you. Candidate Fruman. So I completely support the goal. Um, I call them in the Washington Post. Just the future land use map was concerned that it would lead to displacement. And I made the point in my, that we did our displacement in this years ago, and it's, and the city is not changed demographically. This part of the city has not changed demographically. 
if we're going to address that, we need to very consciously pursue having more housing and having more affordable housing. Where are our opportunities? Our opportunities are on the corridors, Friendship Heights, enormous opportunity, using public lands, using air rights over public buildings, increased incentives and subsidies to make sure affordable components, that we have affordable components. We need to use every, I've at the listener home, I've helped to build a coalition through the Washington interface it's to the for increased affordable housing. Press for it on the council. Thank you. Your audio is going in and out again, so I'm just going to let you know that in case that's you my try 60 to... minute break. Okay, right, I, 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 gotta, I gotta go and come. Let me try again. Thank you. And meanwhile, candidate Goulet on this question, you're up next. Well, thank you. I, th I certainly think it's good to set goals and we need to set goals for making this a livable city for everyone, certainly an inclusive city. I think we also have to though, look at the implementation of those goals. And, and you'll note on the report you cited that there's an asterisk that cites not just the production of affordable housing, but the asterisk says or vouchers that they basically may be using vouchers to meet that affordable housing production goal. And that's frankly my concern is that in, in going after a goal, we've lost sight of you know, the oversight and the effectiveness of this program. And, and I think you know, Mary Che was really criticized for saying we should pause a second. And I'm not suggesting we should pause the overall program, but we really do need to look at the density of the number of residents with vouchers that are living in certain units without the wraparound services there almost creating like a low barrier shelter environment where we really need to ramp up behavioral health services, family support services at these, at these sites. And we need to have an honest and frank discussion if people are able to have that about what is really going to work with this voucher program going forward. So I, I wanna to listen to our residents on the program and I intend to, and I intend to keep fighting for something that makes sense on the program. Thank you, Canada Bergman. Yeah, so look, I. We need to build a lot more housing. We need to build a lot more affordable housing. Uh, the, if we just hit that target uh, that the mayor set, we will not be where we need to be, right? The scale of our solutions need to match the scale of the problems. And that's been a huge issue in the district when it comes to housing. Um, we're just running in place because things keep getting worse while we focus on a project that delivers 300 units, 200 units. That's not what we need to do. So, Absolutely, we need to densify along our corridors. We absolutely need to leverage public property, building not just on one library here, or one library there. We need to have a master plan to redevelop all public property to have housing. Uh, we need to take a look between those avenues and those corridors at how we can in, uh, increase the supply of housing of different types, smaller row homes that are not $4 million homes or small apartment buildings that other people can live in, normal people can live in, not just the people who are the wealthiest of the wealthy, which is what is happening in Ward 3. We are becoming like those cities in Northern California where people have to live very, very far away to come and work here. It's not sustainable and it's not healthy for our city. Thank you. And I just wanna check that I didn't lose track. And Canada Brown, I started with you, correct? So we've all gone on this question. Thank you. <laughs> Every now and then I need a reminder. So. Bill, if you would like to jump in, I know you had another question you wanted to ask, and I think it looks like um, Matt Freeman is not back on, but when he comes back on, we can make sure he gets to hear the question. And Bill, I think you're muted. Yeah. There you go. I'd like to talk about the Van Ness building at Van Ness and Connecticut Avenue. It's an enormous building and part of a complex of bigger buildings there that have been there for a long time and uh, are rent controlled, rent stabilized. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, th there was an attempt uh, to get uh, through the council an exemption for tenant right to purchase, which apparently was stopped. But there's still a great deal of uh, pressure uh, to convert that building, uh, maybe to allow the tenants to, uh, to buy it and um, or not to, to try to circumvent that. Uh, there's a very active tenant association and uh, 
Uh, I would like to get your uh, opinions, your support. If you've had any contact with the leaders there or with the tenants themselves about the Van Ness. Tell us about your feelings about Van Ness. And these will be one minute again. And let's start with candidate Finley on this one. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Bill, for the question. Yes, I have spoken to tenants there, and I believe I've spoken to leaders of the Tenant Association there. Uh, I believe that's James Sindarik, uh, or at least he's the ANC commissioner there. Uh, you know, the our, our tenant protections are it could be strengthened. We've got really great ones, but the ability to organize is sort of cut by the, uh, it's sort of cut by the, the ability to buy out tenants in, uh, when there's a COPA. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, Matt cannot come in. Uh, sh what do we do about that? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Well, let's pause real quick um, and see Rob or Tom, if you are there, are you able, because I am not the host. And so I do not see the messages to admit someone. And so Rob or Tom, if you are there, can hear us. We need you to be able to respond. And if I could just ask Bill, because I want to make sure and we'll come back to you, candidate Finley, um, if you wouldn't mind, if you want to mute and maybe do you mind giving one of them a call because I don't see them immediately coming on. So we'll get him back yeah, in yeah, here. Okay, I'll follow Thank up. you. And we'll make sure he has a chance to hear the question and answer it. And I will say that because you were interrupted, <laughs> we will give you a... Uh, Mr. Finley, if you want to, you know, go a little over, restart, go a little over, I'll leave it to you because of the Thank interruption. You. Go for it. Thank you. Okay. So, so yes, I've been in touch with, with folks in the, those buildings. I have some friends who live there. Uh, it's the, the, we have great tenant protections. Uh, we need to strengthen them. Uh, you know, the, the tenant association's right to organize is fantastic. I think we need a little more technical assistance on that, not just uh, through the Neighborhood Based Activities Fund for low-income buildings, but also for uh, for tenant associations that are trying to form in non-low-income areas. Uh, TOPA, I think, is is a really great opportunity or a great great program, but uh, you know the law has a lot of wrinkles and. Uh, one right granted to tenants is the ability to to sell or relinquish the opportunity to purchase, and and some of these buyouts you know go for fifty sixty thousand uh, dollars, but these buyouts can have negative effects. You know they they, they sometimes are used as something new, what I compare to union busting. They offer to waive one's uh, topa rights for compensation reduces overall the tenant association's ability to collectively bargain and to negotiate. So when individual buyouts happen, the vacated units are often re rented at, at market rates. So I, I'd like to see, um, which removes obviously the lower priced units from, from, the, uh, from the market, uh, even when the Tenants Association has been successful in organizing. So I'd like to see some, uh, some vetting of third party buyers of individual TOPA rights. Uh, I'd like to see strengthening of renters rights generally. And uh, I have no idea how much over time I've gone at this point. Yeah, I was going to say, I will allow the other candidates because that might have been just a little bit more than a minute. So starting with, um, because candidate Fruman is not back, but this is great because I think it's opened up a broader discussion about Topa as well. And he is back. Um, and so why don't we not put can him I, on the spot, but go can to- I, um, Can I wrap up with one last sentence? Please. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. I really think we need to uh, to better fund the the TOPA acquisition program and uh, the housing preservation fund to make sure that all of this uh, can preserve the the, the ha affordable housing that uh, that TOPA seeks to preserve. Great. Um, and what I'm going to suggest, because I want to make sure we're fair to everyone, is let's um, candidate Fruman. We're going to skip you only for the moment, so you have a chance to hear what others are saying. And if we could on the timer on this, if we can give 90 seconds and let's let everyone have a little more time to uh, not only respond to Bill's question about Van S, but if you have other thoughts to share about TOPA generally as candidate Finley just did. So candidate Goulet, let's have you go next and we'll make our way back around to candidate Fruman. Thank you. Well, thank you. And generally, you know, I do support TOPA, but it's been difficult for tenants to use. So I think it's time the council sit down with everyone you know, try to talk about, you know, in, in a calm way, what would be reasonable changes to the law that would, would make it easier, uh, you know, for both sides, frankly, to move forward with TOPA, because I think a lot of it's being caught up right now 
in, in legal fees. It's not really moving expeditiously to closing. And, and we've got resources now. We do have, it's not unlimited, but with $500 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund, and we could authorize some of that to be used to create home ownership opportunities for people through TOPA. But I think the law needs you know, a second look just to see how we can make it easier for tenants to purchase and finance those units. Because I mean, home ownership really is what I'm gonna to try to focus on here uh, as Ward 3 Council Member, making sure that you know, people who you know, may have been renters their whole life but see the opportunity to realize the dream of home ownership can then own their unit here in DC. But uh, you know, we've gotta you know, give them financing assistance and we've got the tools to do that. And I think that would be something that you know, I would fully support the Van Ness site or frankly, any site uh, to look at ways that DC can, you know, move that along uh, to get more of our tenants uh, from a place where they have only been renting their whole lives uh, into a situation where they can finally say that this is my unit, I own this unit. But there's one thing I want to add. We also need to make sure that, you know, when we look at this building, they're structurally sound, that issues uh, have been addressed with maintenance because many of these are older buildings. And we need to make sure that the district protects those tenants uh, through this process. Thank you. Thank you, Canada Bergman, you're up next. Yeah, so I've talked to folks uh, at 3003 Van Ness, and, and I will say, uh, if every building in the city had a tenants association as organized as they are, uh, we would be in a very different place citywide. Um, they're extremely impressive. I, I would give my compliments to them. But, you know, some of the challenges that they're dealing with um, are really, there are systemic problems of we have landlords who are in it to make, not land, landlords implies it's individuals. These are massive corporations that are trying to squeeze a profit uh, and low, reduce their margins as much as possible. And they use their connections in the council because this is a one party city where there isn't a lot of competition once you're there. And there's a lot of pressure to do what special interests want. And it, they're in a lot of scrutiny about it because Again, there isn't a lot of uh, subsequent competition for a lot of these members. So uh, this is a, a classic example of someone trying to give a giveaway to a well-connected interest group and doing it in a way that could hurt people. So obviously we can't ex have exemptions um, and laws that are there, not only to give tenants the right to, to purchase, but also just to force uh, landlords to be fair when they deal with tenants because they know that that option is there. Um, and on, I think Eric made a great point, you know, structural integrity of some of these older buildings should be a major concern. In New York, there's a lot of focus on what can we do to make sure that older buildings last another 50, 100 years, because that's not a straightforward proposition. You got to do that through giving them money uh, in some cases, but also enforcing the law and making sure that they're following through on their obligations uh, and not, um, you know, hurting tenants to, to make a quick buck. Thank you, Candidate Brown. And then we're going to circle back to you, Candidate Fruman, I promise. Okay. Um, I've, I've been working on these types of issues for many years. Um, when I interned with the Office of Administrative Hear Hearings, um, Housing Conditions um, Division, as well as as a title company owner, we have a lot, obviously, a lot of buildings um, that come before me uh, who... Um, where there's tenants. And so we have to deal with TOPA, whether it's our single family TOPA or multi-unit TOPA. And here's what the problem is, is we have situations where um, the laws are not being followed. People are doing things that they shouldn't be doing to try and get the tenants out or try to uh, intimidate tenants so that they'll have vacancies so they can sell the building. Of course, we have this situation uh, with the multi-units now um, just been going on for years where you have the right to sell your TOPA rights. And then when you do, that person may hold the seller hostage or try to hold up the deal. We have to close all these loopholes because the whole point of TOPA is to make sure that uh, tenants who want to stay in their units, who want to buy their units are able to do so. So when we're talking about the Van Ness building, yes, I'm in support of the association being able to uh, buy their building um, at market rate and having first right of refusal. Uh, this is once again, a way where we can ensure that people who want to live in the ward uh, are able to do so and are able to afford to stay um, here in the ward for as long as they want to. Thank you. Thank you. And then Kenneth Fruman, I will say if I can paraphrase the question that you missed, that the question as you may have picked up on was on Van S and the Request that have been made that appears for now to not be a, a, a an active uh, moving piece of legislation for an exemption from TOPA to 
uh, have a, per a sale made to somebody who made affordable housing promises, but also more generally, your thoughts on TOPA, and we have been giving folks 90 seconds to answer on this one. Okay, so I'll, I may not use all 90 seconds. I, I heard about this. I met with somebody from the Tenants Association and was astonished at the idea. I mean, there are other lawyers who are on here. It struck me as a taking. I mean, it's a targeted piece of legislation that would take away settled rights of a specific group of people. Uh, I, I, I was astonished that it was on the table and would at least look at it in terms of does it create a right of action? So on the idea for that building specifically, you, uh, making such an exemption is outrageous. Uh, the, the idea of TOPA is a super important one. One of the things that people talk about all of the time is disparities of wealth. Um, and, the, and one of the major drivers of it is having the ability to own property and have that property grow over time. And so giving people the opportunity to purchase property. And even if it turns out that what you're doing is capturing some of that value by selling your right, uh, that can be a, a reasonable approach too, but giving folks the opportunity to seize that value and be in that game is a super important thing. So uh, there, are, can it be improved? Everything can be improved. Are there places where people find a weakness here, a weakness there, and you need to plug holes? Absolutely, but the core idea of it is really important. And, and if one of our goals is wealth creation for people who haven't had wealth before, it's a super important tool. All right, thank you everyone. So we are gonna switch to a slightly different format for this next uh, really set of questions. So let me set it up. So we've mentioned rent stabilization or rent control. Um, and Ward 3 has many buildings that are subject to rent control. And so we'd like to ask about some specific policy proposals that are out there as ideas. And I'm going to ask each of you as we go around to answer the question, do you support this? Yes or no? No explanation, just yes or no. So we can go through a list. Um, but I will give a little introduction to each of them. I suspect you all are familiar with all of these ideas. And for this first one, we will start with candidate Fruman because you're up on the um, rotation. Um, and so the first question has to do with the coverage of rent control. Rent control only covers older buildings at this point, but when it was put in place in the 70s, it actually covered most units and most buildings. And so there is a proposal that's been mentioned to cover buildings built in 2005 or older, as opposed to 1975 under current law and sweep in um, a number of buildings and units into the current rent control system. So the question is, do you support this, yes or no? And we're just gonna go around, candidate Fruman. Yes to the principal, I'm sure on the date. Very good. Uh, that was very Eat diplomatic it. of you to say <laughs> yes with a short explanation. Candidate Goulet, yes or no? No. Candidate Bergman. Yes. Candidate Brown. Sorry, no. And candidate Finley. I've been saying yes to this question the whole campaign. All right, and let me, give me a second to look at my other screen, which I've been trying to avoid doing. Okay, um, another exception under the rent control law currently is that owners with four or fewer units are exempt from rent control. There are many four unit buildings in the District of Columbia, as I'm sure you all are aware. And so that means that if an owner only owns one four unit building, they are exempt. Um, it also means the tenants in that building, whether they are protected or not under rent control depends on who owns the building. Would you support changing the small landlord exemption so it is three or fewer units um, and that owners who have four units or more would be covered by rent control, yes or no? And we are going to start on this one with candidate Goulet. No. And candidate Bergman. Yes. Candidate Brown. No. Candidate Finley. Another yes the whole time. <laughs> Candidate Fruman. No. All right. Um, something else that has been a very active issue in Ward 3 over the years is something called voluntary agreements. Voluntary agreements, when the provision was put in place in the rent control law, were intended to allow 
landlords and tenants to bargain and come up with agreements where the rents go up, landlords provide something in return, everyone agrees, um, and it requires 70%, a super majority of tenants to agree. But what we have seen in more recent years, and the data has proven this out, just in Ward 3 is definitely on the list where buildings have gone through this, that owners have promised tenants, we will raise the rent for future tenants, not you. You just need to agree to the rent increase, no problem. Um, and there are varying degrees of improvements that are then made for those tenants. So there is a current moratorium on voluntary agreements. Would you support making the moratorium on voluntary agreements permanent? Yes or no? Candidate Bergman. I think so, yes. Candidate Brown. Yes. Candidate Finley. Yes. Candidate Fruman. No. I, I said yes. Could you hear me? No. We, you froze for a minute. That was very dramatic, but we got your yes now. <laughs> All right. I wasn't Candidate sure what Goulet. you were going to say. Candidate Goulet. No. Okay. And then um, next, I want to talk about hardship petitions for a moment. So the hardship provision in the rent control law says that landlords get a guaranteed 12% return. And it's not simple profit. It is actually based on equity, which means the more cash you have in the building, the more you're allowed to make. It means that smaller landlords with less cash in their building are entitled to less um, and it also means that tenants often face very large rent increases. There is a proposal to change this law to be just a profit analysis. How much profit is the owner making so they can pay their bills and still make some profit? And also to lower that 12% down to 5%. So the question is, would you support that reform to the hardship petition bill? And now I'm going to forget who I need to start with. Candidate Brown. Thank you. Candidate Brown. Yes. Candidate Finley. Yes. Candidate Fruman. Uh, yes. Candidate Goulet. Yes. Candidate Bergman. Yes. I think that was the only all yes so far. Um, and then finally, this may be rent control adjacent. Um, there are jurisdictions that have a cap on rent increases for all units, even the newest units. It's generally set a little higher than um, perhaps rent control might be set. And we're not going to say a number, although if you want to offer one, feel free. But the question is, would you support a program or a law in D.C. that said there's some upper limit on the annual rent increase for every unit, whether it was built in the 20s or the 30s, I mean 1920s or 1930s, or whether it was built in 2020. Um, and we will start with candidate Finley. Would you support that, yes or no? Yes. And candidate Fruman. Yes. Candidate Goulet. Yes, if they could opt in. Candidate Bergman. Uh, yes. There and Canada Brown. Yes. Thank you all. Um, so we're, we're going to switch back to the prior format of one minute. And what I want to ask each of you to do in this one minute, um, we have talked about a lot of different potential solutions on housing issues. So I would love to hear each of you pick something that you feel like maybe we haven't talked about enough you'd like to say more about, you think is another new or great idea that we need to be pursuing and tell us for one minute why. Um, and we are going to start on this one with candidate Fruman. Did I get the rotation right there? I think so. One minute. Okay. I mean, there's a number of things that we've talked about a little bit, not a lot. Uh, community land trusts, I think we need to look for ways to be supporting community land trusts. That's, a, that's an important vehicle. I think the planning processes in the corridors in Ward 3 are super important. We need to use to promote more housing and more affordable housing. I think focusing on the public land and air rights over public buildings, there's lots of opportunities. The first one that's being talked about is in Chevy Chase over the rec center and the library. There are other places where there are public buildings with great opportunities to uh, build a and the last one is trying to assist faith-based organizations and mission-driven organizations to use some of their land in order to build affordable housing, I think is an important thing. I think there's a willingness, but there is an expertise. And so if we can assist folks, we may be able to loosen the jar and get more affordable housing than we otherwise would. 
Whoops, I was muted. Thank you, Ken Agulay, you're up on that. Well, thank you. This is an award three issue, but the revenue impact of it affects everything in the city. And I think it's the most exciting opportunity for affordable and workforce housing here in the city. And that's looking at the situation we have downtown. I'd like to commend the mayor for putting a pilot program in place uh, to start to convert some of our office space into residential living downtown. Now, right now, uh, the vacancy rates for our large office buildings are very high. If uh, the appeals go through of those property assessments, the city could be at risk of hundreds of millions of dollars, which impacts you know, human services, public education, public safety issues across the city. So we need somebody who's ready to lead right now on addressing that issue. And what's gonna be really exciting to me is the Tax Revision Commission is coming back together, led by Tony Williams, who's endorsed me in this race, and I'm very proud to have former Mayor Williams support. He's gonna be leading the Tax Revision Commission to look at tax law and how we incentivize adding residential housing downtown, how we make downtown a livable place after 5.30 p.m., and how we make this the most exciting city to come to and to live and work with zero carbon footprint, because you'll be able to walk out of your unit right to your job downtown. And then th that's a win-win for everyone. Thank you, Canada Bergman, you're up. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think there were a few great things just mentioned, but I, I guess the ones that haven't been discussed is that uh, the in between the avenues. So we have a lot of discussion about densifying uh, on our corridors, but we need to also be talking about gentle density in our single family uh, low density neighborhoods. And I think the planning process, Matt raised the planning process. I, I wanna disagree there. We should not be having endless discussions about whether to build apartment buildings on Wisconsin and on uh, Connecticut Avenue. It's, it is absurd. We need to build apartment buildings there. Full stop, let's move forward. Let's have a discussion about where we can build uh, small multifamily properties in uh, low density areas. Let's talk about excessive minimum lot size requirements in the district, especially in Ward 3. It is illegal to build a row home in neighborhoods in, in Ward 3. We're not talking about uh, you know, multifamily housing here. We're talking about small homes that someone in a work, uh, so a teacher or a firefighter or, or even a, a, you know, a highly paid professional uh, could, could acquire. Uh, we, we need to make that possible to build. And that uh, is something that I want to focus on. Thank you, Canada Brown. So the policies we've had in place in recent years have been um, not uh, helping everyone. And what I mean by that is that we need to make sure that we are moving forward with new policies that will allow everyone who wants to live in the ward safe and affordable housing. So we need to look at things like, like we discussed tonight, social housing, uh, community land trust, um, ADU, we didn't talk about affordable dwelling units, but that's also an option. And making sure that we are looking at sites that will promote uh, areas where we can build mixed use housing so that people can once again work and live and play um, in the same locations near our metros, near our major quarters. When we start doing that and we start making those units available, we can then start to look at other ways to increase um, uh, units, including looking at some of our commercial spaces, bringing in some of our small businesses, making sure that uh, we are making them accessible to everyone in the ward and making sure that anyone who wants to uh, come here once again can come and live here in Ward 3 and feel um, part of the community. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, candidate Finley on that question. Well, again, going last, it's a funny one. Uh, I agree with what Candidate Goulet said. I agree with what Candidate Bergman said. And I'll add on to about uh, also about the row homes. We also need to be able to build uh, small apartment buildings, garden style apartment buildings like we have up the street for me on Porter. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about tonight is renters' rights. We didn't really we didn't really delve into that. Uh, you know, fifty five to sixty percent of the district's population are renters. Uh, we've got a great tenants' bill of rights, but it can be strengthened. Uh, I'd like to expand it by adding fee limitations on uh, restrict application fees, late fees, uh, the fees that get attached to security deposits, for example, the fee to get your deposit back, you know, getting rid of those sort of things, prohibiting those, uh, having first come first serve. So we require landlords to accept the first rental application that meets their publicly stated regulations, you know, providing relocation assistance when a building is not in livable condition, uh, you know, tenants should be able to uh, 
live in a safe and secure building and we need to have DCRA doing surprise inspections, more frequent surprise inspections, building conditions. We need to allow tenants to be able to repair their homes and charge the landlord when the landlord neglects repairs. And finally, we need to require landlords that participate in housing subsidy programs to provide adequate security for all residents. All right, thank you all. So we do wanna leave time at the end for everyone to make a closing statement. But before we do that, we wanna try something unusual. Um, perhaps, which is we want to give each of you a chance to ask one of the other candidates a question. Um, and so what I'm going to ask our timers to do is give 30 seconds for the question, one minute for the answer. I'll try to keep repeating that. Um, and Kenneth Goulet, you are up first. So if we could give him 30 seconds to give whatever introduction and direct to another candidate your question, and we'll give that candidate a minute to respond. Can I just do a simple up or down? Uh, maybe it's a it's a one. We'll just give it. Yeah, to everybody. I should say if you want to do thing. an up a down up or down for everyone, yeah. feel free. Well, th this will be a quick one because you know we were on a, the the forum uh, you know recently uh, with the Stonewall Democrats, and you know there was a question asked about you know would you support 160 million dollars more added to the budget for excluded workers, which included payments to sex workers uh, in the budget, and, and I was the only one who expressed concern about that because. You know, I know there's other priorities in the budget, including affordable housing, including education and public safety. So all of my candidates said they would support adding $160 million to the budget for this that wasn't funded. So I would ask them all now, what would they have cut? What $160 million would you have cut or would you have raised taxes by $160 million? So that question goes to everyone since you supported that over other things. And let me just, I'll go through quickly and ask you just to keep your responses quick, obviously, as a matter of time, but, you know, perhaps try to stick to 30 seconds and we'll go with Ben Bergman, candidate Bergman first. Great. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, you know, as you know, I don't like up or down questions. And if you looked at my questionnaire, I don't um, uh, support some of the um, uh, some of the proposals with respect to sex work uh, legalization. Uh, I have a more middle ground approach. But I would say, look, uh, on excluded workers, on, on documented folks who need support, uh, we, there are, A, I will just, I'll just step back and say this. Yes, I would raise taxes for that if that's what was necessary. I'm not saying it is, though, Eric, and I'm not going to make a preemptive commitment in this race to not raise taxes on the wealthiest of Ward 3, um, people who live near you near the Palisades in order to help people who are just barely making it by. Thanks. Canada Brown. Uh, no, I do not support that at all. Candidate Finley. You well, supported it at the support. forum, Deidre. <laughs> so I would ask not to interrupt right. answers. You got your chance. I hear you. Candidate Finley. Sex work is work. And you know when we're talking about funding for somebody, for undocumented immigrants, for sex workers, we are talking about their housing. We are talking about uh, their ability to put food on the table. And so, yes, I would support $160 million for excluded workers. I said that at the forum and I continue to say that. Uh, you know, I think we've got the money. I think we can find the money. We had quite the surplus. Uh, you know, I don't think that that is really the issue. And I appreciate your attempt at a gotcha, Eric. And Ed Freeman. Yeah, so on the sex work question, I also um, like Ben, I, oh, well, I don't know exactly what Ben said, but I, I, I don't I think that's an issue that ought to be addressed, addressed through a referendum. In terms of the excluded workers, these are people who are the most vulnerable. And we tried to help everybody else and we weren't helping them. And so, yes, we need to find a way to help those people. This is not a long term going on forever kind of thing. There is a surplus if it took, if it meant dipping into the surplus in order to get this done to help the people who are the most vulnerable. In principle, I want to do it, and I would figure out a way to get it done. Thank you. Candidate Bergman, let's give you 30 seconds to ask a question to one or more of your fellow candidates. OK. Um, so uh, as folks know, if they've listened to me at these forums, I've talked a lot about housing and child care, which combined create an incredible burden on families. Folks know that housing, we are tied for number one, we're maybe slightly below Hawaii, it depends on how you look at it in terms of our housing costs. We are number one in terms of our daycare costs. Uh, daycare for infants is one third of the median income of an average Washingtonian. Combine that with housing, 
it's impossible for people to live here. It's a huge problem. My question is, I guess, directed to the progressive candidates. Uh, so Bo and, and Matt, um, you've heard me talk about this endlessly. I, I take a look at your guys' websites. It's not there. And I haven't heard you guys talk about it once at a forum. Um, that said, it hasn't really come up because people aren't asking about it, which I don't quite understand. So what is your plan uh, to make it possible for families to thrive? And how are we going to address that childcare burden? So, Matt, do you mind if I go first? Canada Finley. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, yeah, Ben, uh, you know, this comes up on the doors a lot and I am supportive of universal daycare. Uh, I think we need we need it to free up families to uh, to get get them back to work and to make sure that we are uh, giving children the, the opportunity to have the socio emotional growth they need. Uh, yeah, that's my answer. Canada Fruman. So I need to update my website. The key place that this comes up is in the birth to three debate and the question of whether or not we should fully fund birth to three. I've always said we should fully fund birth to three and I'll have it reflected on my website by tomorrow, I hope. Thank you Can we all, all just answer it? Can we all get yeah, a chance to answer I, this question? If, if you wanna say a brief answer yeah. and we'll let Canada right. Brown say that I mean, and then pose her yeah. question. Okay, great. It's just, it's nice to hear everybody talking about the birth to three act, which I wrote while I was working on the health committee and that they support that act that's you know, revolutionary and changing child care. I'd like to commend the council and Chairman Mendelson for taking a huge step forward in uh, making sure that those increases that were passed for our child care workforces were allocated. So I'd like to commend the chairman on that. And uh, you just point out, we've got to keep working on this. We need to now get to the last phase of the legislation, which is to make sure that we increase access across the city so that no family pays more than 10% of their income on child care. And it's going to be difficult. We're going to need somebody who knows how to work the budget because Unlike what one of my previous candidates said, there is no surplus anymore. The surplus now at the end of the year goes to the Housing Production Trust Fund 50% and 50% to our PAYGO capital projects, which are things like school modernization. So uh, when people say, yeah, we're going to find it in the surplus, we're going to find $160 million there. I mean, it just shows they're trying to please everybody, but not real, really give answers. And, and we need to be serious about the budget. How can you say that, Eric? You're, for, you're opposed to raising taxes, and yet you're talking about putting pre-K-3 classrooms in every school and, and fully funding so birth let's, to How? Let, let's give Canada Brown a chance if she wants to discuss that issue and then let her have a chance if she wants to pose a question. Um, I'm, yes, I am in support of the um, of child care um, pre-K through uh, child care, birth through 3K. Obviously as a parent of five kids, I know how much of a challenge to try and work and um, make sure that you're picking up and dropping off your kids and affording uh, safe and reliable um, child care. My question is this, is something that hasn't come up much on the campaign trail, but it's something that's really important to me. Uh, my youngest son was diagnosed in second grade as being on the autism spectrum. Uh, he has his Asperger's. He was in a DCPS school at the time. The whole process was horrible. I'm just gonna say that out loud. Um, and so my question becomes, what do we do as a community to ensure that our kids who are in the community who need special education are able to attend school in, in the city, if not in the ward? My son is bused with several other kids to Laurel, Maryland. Uh, when I was looking at schools, all schools on the list in Laurel and in Virginia, I don't know why we don't have these programs right here for our kids so that our kids do not have to be on the bus um, for hours at a time and can get the education and support that they legally are entitled to right here in district boundaries. So I would like uh, anyone who wants to comment on that. So why don't we start, Ken and Finley, if you wanna start, any comment you wanna make on that? Sure, uh, you know, Deirdre, I'm, I'm sorry, DCPS <clears throat> and our school system is failing to provide ad adequate support for family. Uh, you know, this is something we have a, a, a dearth of special education teachers, uh, we have, you know, I, as we've all discussed, we've had we have a lot of problems with our schools, a lot of issues we need to fix. But special education is one we need to absolutely pour money into. We absolutely need to get special education teachers. I know Merch has a deficiency. Uh, you know, Horse Man has a deficiency. We need to work hard on fixing this issue. And I think, I, and I'm committed to doing so. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you, candidate Fruman. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the numbers on special ed and you see how special children who are in special education are performing and what kind of growth we're seeing, it is really 
terrible. I mean, we are falling on our faces, failing. And we have for years, year after year, and it gets papered over and we give ourselves a parade as if our, our schools are working so well when the kids who need us the absolute most are being let down. We gotta treat this as something that's serious. We gotta stop patting ourselves on the back and saying how great we are. There are way too many people who are being let down by the system as it works today. I'll be with you there to make sure that we do. Thank you, Canada Goulet. Well, Deirdre, I'm sorry to hear about your child's experience at the school. Uh, and that's really heart wrenching. And you know what we, I think, need to do to address that is take a second look at, first of all, this two-step process. First of all, make sure the funding is there. When I was the council's uh, or the city's budget director back in 2011, we raised the level one through four rates uh, for add-ons for special education. And that, that actually really did improve services that the schools were providing. You know, but then money is not the only thing. We need to then follow up through oversight to make sure that if we increase funding through the adequacy study, which you know, it sounds like we need to do, then we need to make sure that the schools are delivering the services in a way uh, that's appropriate for any child's IEP and make sure that those needs are being met in our neighborhood schools, because no child should have to be bused out of state. They should be able to receive an education in an inclusive setting in their neighborhood school. And that's something that I fully support. So I'd be glad to work with you on that. And I'm excited uh, you know, that we have an opportunity through the adequacy study to hopefully address the unfortunate situation uh, that your child faced. So I'm excited to work with you and I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you, Canada Bergman, your comment there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll echo what Eric said. I mean, I think the, I know, I know folks who, uh, you know, on a pro bono basis have represented families trying to get the, the, the services that they deserve and they have to go through a prolonged, uh, you know, legal process often. And, and that means that the folks who are able to navigate that are the folks who have resources or have uh, insights into the system. There are a lot of kids who don't get even, you know, placed out of state because their parents are not able to navigate it. They don't know about it. It's a huge problem. It's a funding issue, but it's also reorienting our bureaucracy towards actually making sure that kids are getting the services they need and are fighting kids. When a parent says that my kid is struggling, that should be a three alarm fire um, and we should figure out how to help them, not um, subject them to basically a litigation process. Thank you all. Candidate Finley, it's your chance, your turn, if you want to pose a question to your fellow candidates. All righty. Uh, no, so, well, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, Bill, I know this is your doing. Uh, thank you for it. Uh, so over and over, we see what the root cause of, of poverty. Thank you. <laughs> we see we see the root cause of poverty is or of, of, sorry, I'm sorry, of crime is poverty. And, uh, you know, we've seen it with the pandemic job losses over the past two years. Uh, given this, given the evidence that the cash transfers work, that ca ca Thrive DC showed this, uh, Chicago has shown this, that it, it, it is, cash transfers have reduced violent crime both in DC and in Chicago. Will you commit to funding pilot programs, further funding pilot programs for cash transfer to low income households at a level of $10 million next year to aid uh, to alleviate poverty and to uh, to further reduce crime. Candidate Fruman, you're up first on this one. So I, I guess I could go on for a while because to echo the things that both said, but I'm, the short answer is yes, that the, the success of that program requires that we pursue it more fully. Candidate Goulet. Thank you. So, I mean, right now, I mean, for me, I couldn't support it uh, because I, right now we have a situation where there's actually underemployment. And I apologize, there's a helicopter <laughs> going around here, which is uh, kind of messing up my connection. So if you can't hear me. So the, uh, I mean, the issue with the uh, program would be is that right now there's underemployment in the city. We have jobs right now that we can't fill. So I would invest the money in the Department of Employment Services to create job training programs for our residents that actually connect to careers. I think that's the route we should be going because Bo's absolutely right on this. Poverty is the root cause of crime. And the way out of poverty is jobs and education. So those, those would be my two focuses uh, you know, when elected. And also making sure that when DOES has a program, it doesn't end in a certificate, it ends in a career. So I think there needs to be a drastic reform of what we expect and we demand as a council member out of our programs at the Department of Employment Services to ensure that they actually create jobs that lift our residents out of poverty in this city. 
Senator Bergman, your response. Yeah, but I don't know the number. I don't know if that's the right number. I haven't thought about whether it should be higher. So, but I'll say yes to it. I mean, I think the, the you know, the child tax credit payment that people received uh, this last year was, uh, we know, you know, big picture, the newspaper talked about how, how important it is, but I, I talked to people, I know that it made a difference knowing that there was that extra bit coming. Um, I think the one thing I would add to it is I want us to look seriously at how, to, how we can help people who are unbanked in this city get connected into the financial system. Because I agree with Eric, job training is essential, but uh, we, we underestimate the importance of being unbanked and being outside that financial system in all sorts of ways, getting a job, getting credit, uh, getting having the ability to, 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 to receive financing for whatever one needs. Um, and that, so postal banking is something we could explore uh, at the local level. We can, we can push forward uh, other, other initiatives that are small and some that are medium sized to try to connect people to the financial system, uh, both in terms of building credit, learning about credit, getting a bank account, not um, relying on, on predatory uh, payday lenders, et cetera. Thank you. Finally, candidate Brown. So I don't know what the number, the budget number should be, but yes, I am in favor of continuing that program, um, but it's not an either or, right? So we can continue that program and also uh, work on some of these other issues we've talked about tonight, making sure that people are able to um, earn a livable wage, that they have the training, the job skills, whether it's retraining or training in um, high school so they can come out and become productive members of the, the community. Uh, yes, of course. We can't have people who are unbanked because when you're unbanked, then you can't participate fully in the economy. You can't um, get uh, get credit. You can't uh, purchase a home. You can't do anything. Um, and a lot of those who are unbanked, as we know, are in our marginalized communities. And then we have to do much better job of reaching out to them and pulling them in to the community so they can be productive members. But as far as the the subsidies, I do believe that. Um, it's shown that it works. And so I think we should continue it. And it's not sure what um, financial level. Thank you. And then candidate Freeman, your turn for a question. I'm gonna ask our timer just to make sure we leave a little time at the end. Let's do 30 seconds on the questions and answers on this one. Thank you. So uh, uh, ask a question to Eric, but everybody's answering everything. So I give them the invitation to do that. So one of the things that we get that gets talked about is school governance. And one of the questions is, um, with our Aussie, we have in under our system the most complete form of mayoral control, where the mayor controls the schools, but also controls the evaluator in Aussie. And the idea that the you would have the evaluator be independent of the operator of the school seems intuitive to me, and maybe could result in clear information about how we're doing and less spin. But I'm curious, Eric, you oppose independence for Aussie. And is there anything about school governance you would change or do you think we've got it just right? So can well, I believe you go? Yeah, absolutely, I, I think we have the right formula. I think we've seen test scores improve. I think what we need to do is have somebody, you know, as a council member who doesn't want to cede you know, the oversight role the council has back to Aussie. I think right now, I remember it back when we were before mayoral control, back in 2003, where buildings were uh, falling apart, where textbooks weren't provided to students at the beginning of school, and school sometimes didn't even start on time. And oftentimes you had the members of the Board of Education just jockeying to be a council member, and they weren't serving students. So it was a broken system. So I don't support anything that goes back to something that doesn't serve our children well. And I frankly am ready as a council member to come in and provide oversight from day one of mayoral control. And I like the accountability, where if the mayor isn't leading on schools, if the chancellor isn't leading, if the deputy mayor isn't leading, they can be held accountable. So that's what I like is accountability. And I'm ready to lead through oversight as a council member. So let's let candidate Bergman go next on that one. Yeah, so without mayor, without oversight, mayoral control is, uh, flawed, deeply flawed system. We don't have oversight. Glad to hear Eric's going to reinvigorate oversight um, and, and, and get the folks that he, he worked with for many years to finally do their job on this. Uh, on Aussie, I actually don't agree with you, Matt, entirely. I think that we should spin off a separate agency that is independent reports to the council that does the data work 
to double check OSSI and to provide uh, additional oversight. I think we should empower the State Board of Education not to not to undermine mayoral control, but to uh, sort of amplify the council's ability to uh, look very closely at data and whether our school leaders are actually executing what they should, um, which I don't have confidence that we know entirely because politics have infected uh, education policy through the mayoral control system because of a lack of oversight from the council. And then at Brown, you're up. So my oldest daughter's 28, she'll be 20, turning 29 in about four weeks. So I've been at DCPS and uh, independent schools um, parent for a long time. So I remember what it was like before we had mayoral control. What I will say is that it has gotten significantly better. And this is why one of the reasons why schools are overcrowded because they've gotten better. Um, and so I'm not in any rush to go back to what we had. I think we should work with what we have, fix what's not working, keep marital control, and make sure we have um, council oversight so that we can continue to move forward in the pathways that we've been going. Thank you. And then finally, candidate Finley on that question. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, echoing what Ben said, I've been arguing that we need a, uh, an inspector general for education in the city. Uh, you know, we may need a deputy editor for auditing education, uh, you know, a deputy auditor rather uh, in the office of the DC auditor. Uh, we don't have enough oversight. We are not doing robust oversight that we need to do. I think many of us agree here. Uh, we all agree that we want a committee on education that's uh, strong in its oversight. But uh, yeah, that's, I think an IG would be very helpful and help hold uh, OSI accountable. Thank you. Thank you all. So let's now do one minute closing statements. And what I'm gonna do is go in reverse order from what we did when we kicked things off. So that means candidate Goulet, you are up first and then we'll go in reverse alphabetical order. One minute closing statement, thank you. Well, I'd just like to thank you know Tenac and others for, for hosting this forum. I'm excited to work with affordable housing advocates throughout the city if elected to make this a livable city for everyone. And I apologize for frankly feeling a little bit off today. Uh, if those who don't know, uh, you know, eight of my fellow candidates accused me of making defensive comments at a DC chamber forum. I, I had to post the video online uh, to prove that that was frankly inaccurate. And, you know, I think they failed an important leadership test because the residents of Ward 3 have said, we want to be able to come and speak to you frankly about problems. We want you to go address problems as a council member in a way where, you know, we can be heard and we can talk about this without them being attacked. You know, and I raised, you know, concerns about a program that's broken, that's not serving the residents well. Uh, the residents that have vouchers are not being served well. They're not being given the wraparound services they need. And, and instead, you know, out of political desperation, we had eight people making a spectacle of it uh, by putting the letter out there and then subjecting me to attacks, you know, I mean, horrible attacks. I don't know if you guys read any of them. You certainly didn't come to my defense or condemn any of them. I mean, it was really disgusting uh, what was, was said on Twitter. And you know the residents of Ward Three want somebody who's going to lead on important issues uh, for the ward and, and take this seriously and not be you know worried that frankly their council member is going to turn on them and accuse them of things that are just frankly offensive. And uh, you know I'm really disappointed in my other candidates today uh, in, in just what you did, and you know really how you failed an important test to lead for the ward. So I'll conclude with that. Candidate Fruman, your closing statement, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really proud of a record of accomplishment working in the ward for a decade and a half, working with people on all sides of all. My approach has always been to try to listen to people, to try to build coalitions, come up with creative solutions and get things done. Time after time, I've been able to do it. I've been able to do it in part because of the approach I bring, whether it's little things like solving issues around a baseball field and a dog park and putting lights on the field or getting the American University Law School moved to Tenley Circle or getting the Bibbs Billiard Project done. Time after time, I've been able to get it done by working with people. That's what I wanna do when I get on the council. I have ideas, I have things I wanna do, but I wanna hear from the residents of Ward 3 and work with them to get it done. The other thing that I'm gonna bring when I come go to the council is I have worked in all parts of this city and built coalitions citywide. And I will have the ability to be have Ward 3 be heard in other quarters and to be able to hear the concerns of people in other parts of the city to work together because that's what you need to do on the council. You need to build a coalition and get things through and I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Finley, you're up. 
Well, thank you, Ms. Mellon, and thank you, Mr. Rice, for hosting. Thank you, Tenac. Uh, this has been a really nice forum with uh, some of the spiciness uh, aside, of course. Uh, <laughs> you know, Eric, uh, it sounds like you're, you're very offended about what people said on Twitter. Uh, I wouldn't let it get under your skin. Uh, you know, just it would be great to see the rest of the video, see what question was asked. I did not have the opportunity to be at the forum to watch it, but I look forward to seeing the full video. Uh, so one of the reasons I got into this race was because I think we're at a crossroads in the city. Uh, you know, we have the opportunity this election to show that we uh, that we truly want to be a place of inclusiveness, of justice, of equity, and uh, we need somebody who uh, who's been around a while and who can address the long term problems and and uh, with understanding and with you know legal experience, with auditing experience, both of which I have, I can crunch numbers with the best of them. Uh, we need a leader who's demonstrated the progressive, not just through their words, but through their actions. And I fought hard to be such, you know, as a union leader, I fought hard for affordable housing on my ANC. I fought hard for unhoused families on my ANC. And I fought for climate justice. On council, I'll fight for a more inclusive and more just district. So I invite you all to uh, visit my website, bowfinley.com. And please uh, join the campaign and vote for me on June 21st. Thank you. Thank you, candidate Brown. So I just wanted to say that the fact that eight candidates felt the need to come out and say something publicly speaks volumes about the values of War Three residents. And when we're talking about a leadership test, a leadership, a leader knows how to move people from a place of fear into a place of hope. Unfortunately, Ken Goulet is still in the midst of this test and I don't think he's gonna pass. We need a leader in War Three who is not gonna be divisive, who is gonna bring communities together, who's gonna lead from position of equity and inclusion, okay? We, we, in this time and age, when we have you know, people being shot at at the grocery store because of their race, we do not need that type of speak and talk here in this ward. I will come to you as a council member. I will listen to everyone. I have a background in advocacy and social justice. I'm here to bring the community together and make sure that we all are able to live in this community together and peacefully. Thank you. And finally, Kennedy Bergman. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll address the other issues in a second. I'll just to return to the focus of the, of the, of the forum on tenants. I think, you know, we, uh, as we move forward in the city to make it more affordable, we have got to make sure that we're putting the needs of tenants first uh, because they are often the most vulnerable uh, when uh, we look the other way, when regulators uh, have their focus diverted or they're underfunded. I'm very proud of when I was an attorney a uh, practicing attorney, I spent many years representing tenants in housing court. Uh, just recently, I am very uh, happy to, to note um, my team, we won the biggest anti-slap victory in the history of the state of New York, uh, where we uh, defended some tenant organizers who were the victims of, a, of an insane and, and long, years long uh, litigation attempting to suppress their organizing. Uh, I'm gonna take that to the council and make sure that we are standing up for tenants and holding landlords accountable. I'll just to say briefly, you know, Eric, I understand where you're coming from. I understand why you're upset. Uh, your views on, on comments on the voucher holders and the voucher program are well known. The issue was that it wasn't responsive to the question. And the, the fact that you used that answer then offended folks. At the time, it offended everybody in the room. It offended people subsequently. And I would say, you know, it's hard to do, but I would strongly urge you to just apologize and move on. Um, rather than to double down and act as if um, it's everybody else's ears uh, that we're hearing the wrong things. So I'm well, sure many folks well, would well, like to comment on that, but I well, will On the say dais, you get a moment of personal privilege, which is, uh, you know, so when you, when you do become a council member, you get a 30 second moment of personal privilege. <laughs> get your 30 so, seconds. You know, I've spent 20 years serving residents across the city, building new hospitals, you know, writing the Pre-K 3 and 4 Act, writing the Birth to 3 Act, and supporting our residents. So, you know, I'm not gonna apologize for ever fighting hard for oversight for the residents of Ward 3. And I think people are frankly sick of raising valid concerns and then having people attacking them. I mean, it's, it's just too much. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm over it. I'm ready to fight for the ward, but uh, I'm just disappointed in everybody. So that's it. Uh, so can I say one quick thing? It's that Henry Cohen says he gives his regards he asked me to say hello and apologies for missing it. And everybody should go see the production of Les Mis at Jackson Reed. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, That's a wonderful note to end on. <laughs>
Um, when and you where all. is it Les Mis? Please tell it's a, us. It, it, it's a variety of dates, Bill. You can get the tickets online. I already purchased my tickets for Saturday. Oh, so okay. you can come join Thank me. You. you could even be my date if you want, Bill. We'll go together. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> well, on that note, I do want to thank um, the five candidates who are here tonight, but I really want to thank all of the candidates. Thank you for getting in the democratic process. As we saw tonight, it's a tough road to hoe. It you know, can be spicy, as one of you said, but we really appreciate you all digging into all the issues, including the housing issues. And I know TENAC and many other tenant advocates look forward to working with whoever becomes the next Ward 3 Council member on the ward. And so on that note, we will end for tonight and thank you all for joining us and for everyone in the audience who joined us as well. Everybody have a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.